Hi everybody, it's Ashley. Welcome back to my channel and today we are going to be talking about Final Girls by Riley Sager. Can I say redemption? I think this book is the epitome of redemption. I had previously read two Riley Sager books before. Um, the last time I lied, I think it's called some something why I I'm, I'm probably wrong about the title, and I absolutely despised that book. I DNF'd it, um, and I feel bad about it because it seems to be a lot of people's favorite by him. But I really couldn't stand that book. And then um, I also read Home Before Dark, and that one I really really loved. But I expected to because it's a haunted house thing. It had a lot of haunting of Hill House vibes and. That's just the perfect thing for me. That's the type of thing that I absolutely love. So I fully expected to enjoy that book. But this is the one that I felt like was the true test, um, where it was falling into the lines of something that's not my typical thing that I like and really testing to see if I enjoyed his writing style or not. And I have to tell you, I really, really enjoyed this. I don't believe that it is exactly the way that it is um, marketed, but it's a very, very good book in general. Uh, so we are following two timelines, but the exact same character. We are following a woman named Quincy, and it is now 10 years after a massacre that she was the sole survivor of and she has been dubbed a final girl by the press and anybody that is into horror at all um, whether it be movies books a final girl is typically a term used to describe the sole survivor usually a woman in a massacre massacre situation and uh for Quincy, this was an incident in her college days that has been dubbed the Pine Cottage Murders because it took place at a cabin with her friends, and this cabin was called Pine Cottage. So, um, so Quincy gets pulled into a group by the press with two other women who have also been dubbed Final Girls. They were in different massacres than hers but very, very similar in the way that they were carried out and the injuries that these women sustained. One is a woman named Lisa and another is a woman named Samantha. Now we are following 10 years after the Pine Cottage murders and Lisa is gone. And at first it looks like it is a suicide and Quincy starts contemplating, oh, I should have done more for her. I should have been there. Um, cause they only ever talked on the phone. They never met in person. So one day out of the, out of the clear blue sky, Samantha shows up and this is a big shock to Quincy because Samantha has been off the grid for more than eight years. She just disappeared. Nobody has seen her. Nobody knows where she lived. Nobody has any current pictures of her. She really wanted to distance herself from the title Final Girl. And Samantha claims that the reason that she has come to see Quincy is because of Lisa's death. And she too is feeling the guilt of not being more present and she doesn't want to make the same mistake with Quincy so that's why she has shown up to forge a friendship with her and um, let her know that she's always there for her if she ever needs anything. <clears throat> so Quincy and Samantha are about as different as two people can be. Quincy is extremely, extremely successful. She's very grounded. She has this almost fiance that she's been with for a long time. She um, is running an online blog where she decorates cakes and cupcakes and puts, puts them up on her blog. It's a very successful business. She's doing well for herself. And by all means, everybody around her considers her to be normal, despite what has happened to her. Everybody assumes that she has moved on but she hasn't. 
And meanwhile, Samantha is very dark. She's very edgy, like right down to the way that she dresses. She dresses almost entirely in black. She has this rough girl attitude and uh, she's not very well trusted. Um, she rubs people the wrong way. They don't like her. <laughs> um, but Quincy is very, very determined to have this relationship with Samantha that she did not get to have with Lisa and kind of right her wrongs in a way. Now, something that you need to know about Quincy is that she remembers next to nothing about her massacre. And it has created a lot of uh, doubt from police, from doctors, from lots of people that follow the case. So everybody says it's awfully convenient. Um, and nobody really believes that she can't remember anything because the other girls did. And it's like, this was something that drove me crazy about the book because just because one person remembers doesn't mean that another person will. Everybody reacts to trauma in different ways. So, um, just the reasoning that, well, they remembered everything, so you should too. It's, I really, really thought that that was messed up. Um, but Quincy's biggest supporter is actually the cop that saved her life on that night. His name is Coop. And even though it's 10 years after the fact, he still meets up with her regularly to see how she's doing. He's investigated some questionable notes that she's gotten throughout the years. And he's the one that actually told her that Lisa had died. So, I mean, he's a good friend. He's a good support system. And he's one of the few people that was part of the investigation that believed her when she said that she couldn't remember anything. Um, and even Samantha is doubting it because it's like she really, really goads Quincy a lot in trying to get her to talk about what happened to her and get the facts. It's like she's constantly on her trying to get her to get angry. That's literally what she says. She's trying to get her to get angry so that she will talk about it and mostly so that she will say the perpetrator's name, the person that was responsible. She refuses to say his name. She only says him if she has to discuss him. And Samantha does not like this. She's like, why can't you say his name? Why can't you say it? And they, they have lots of fights about it. This is something that is very, very important to Quincy. And it's not that she doesn't know his name because she doesn't remember. She knows who it is, but she just does not want to say his name because she says that he does not deserve it, which I can understand on a certain level. So then things start, some really strange things start to happen. Things start coming out in the paper. Um, and Quincy starts learning some things that make her think that this wasn't just a one-off and that Lisa did not do this to herself. And somebody out there, some sick weirdo is trying to eliminate the final girls. So that is our setup. I love the way that this was written. I like his style and the way that he so smoothly went back and forth in between of uh, the timelines. I thought the characters were very well-rounded and very developed. Um, they were, they were complex characters. They were flawed, but you could very, very well picture what each of them was thinking at all times. Um, I will say this. It wasn't quite what I expected it to be, especially by the name. Um, um, and this was in the horror section of my bookstore. It was not in the thriller section. It was in the horror section. <laughs> so I fully expected this to be a horror novel. And it's not. Um, so if you go into it with that mindset, you're most likely going to be disappointed. Um, luckily for me, I enjoy thrillers. So... It didn't bother me that it was more of a psychological thriller than a horror. That is something to keep in mind while reading. Um, this does get pretty violent and, and uh, gory probably in the last 50 pages or so.
but the rest of the book is a slow burn buildup and it's more of a mystery of like a who done it we're trying to figure out exactly what happened that night and we're trying to figure out who is responsible for things now so it's like it's kind of got more of a who done it kind of a, kind of an aspect to it um but you know the ending is pretty brutal but for those of you that think this is a straight up horror and are expecting that don't go into it expecting that because you will be disappointed that aside this is a very, very well-written book, especially when I consider that this was his debut. Most debuts are the weakest book in a author's bibliography. So the fact that this was his debut, I was actually very, very impressed by it. Um, so let's talk twists. Um, there's one pretty major twist that I did did see coming. It seemed fairly obvious to me, um, but I can't, I'm not going to say what it is. I don't want to spoil the book for you. And um, there's a very good chance that not all readers will pick up on it, but I read a lot of thrillers and I read a lot of horror. So it was glaringly obvious to me. But the biggest one, which came at the end of the book, I did not see. And my mouth was literally hanging open. <laughs> it was literally hanging open. When I read that reveal, I was like, oh, no way. Because it was just in my face. <laughs> but the signs were there. There was even kind of like this whole little uh, flashback sequence where um, memories start coming back to Quincy and she starts seeing things that she had forgotten. And it was there. So it's kind of like we are Quincy and we should know these things, but our minds are suppressed and it comes back to us slowly. So I thought that was an interesting writing choice and I really, really liked the way that that was done. Um, all in all, I gave this five stars. I thought it was excellent. Um, but I know, like I said, I know there's many people out there that will not. But just keep that in mind. I think this was a fun ride. And like I said, I found this as redemption for Riley Sager. I'm going to read more of his stuff now. Um, after, after those other two, I really wasn't sure I wanted to continue. But I was curious about this. Mainly because I read the Final Girl Support Group last year by Grady Hendrix. And that I didn't like. Uh, and I was so disappointed because I wanted to like it so much. But this was kind of redemption. This was more of what I expected from something like that. Because even though it's not technically, technically a support group, it is. Because these girls are available to each other to help each other through their trauma. But they're not having like weekly meetings and actually officially calling it a support group. <laughs> so, um... This one I definitely thought was a lot better. Um, so yeah, that is all that I have for you guys today. If you like this video, please make sure to subscribe, like, comment, follow me on the social meds, ring that bell if you want to be notified of all of my upcoming videos, and I will see you guys next time. Bye! I am so sorry if you can hear that. That's my roommate's dogs. <laughs>